Hello and welcome again to this chat about Rolex, about my Rolex collection. As you can see I've got three. Um, I was going to film a sort of great unboxing but it took so long and wasted an awful lot of time so I didn't bother. So here they are and what I've got is a 2012 Submariner ceramic with date. Um, I found that from you of course. We've got a Daytona um, 2015, I got that one. That's obviously the black-faced Daytona. And in the middle is my latest purchase, which I only got last month, which is the Milgauss Z Blue, which I did a review on a few weeks ago now. Now, I don't intend to do a detailed watch review of each watch. Um, there are thousands of good reviews on YouTube, particularly of the Submariner. It's an iconic Rolex and of course the Daytona. Instead, I just want to do a general sort of ramble about the pros and cons of Rolex, of buying Rolexes and living with them, and discuss things like, is it value for money? Is it worth doing? Do you worry about taking it outside, getting mugged and losing them and so on? So let's uh, start off with the obvious question, and that's how much did they cost? Um, and are they value for money? Well, the Submariner was £5,700, that's UK pounds, and I believe it's still the same price now even after three years. When there'll be a price rise, I have no idea. And I guess nobody else knows apart from Rolex themselves. The Daytona's just been replaced by the much hyped ceramic bezeled version. Um, and that was uh, 7950 new, which was a hell of a lot of money for me. It took me a long time to sort of save up for that and to pay for it. And in fact, I was on a waiting list for about a year. Uh, before I got the phone call to say come and buy it so I went along and even when I sat down to pick it up I was still in two minds whether or not to actually go ahead and buy it because it's such a lot of money but in the end I thought oh well it's now or never um, I finally got to the top of the list and I do love that dial and I love chronographs so I came home with it and then just last month I finally got this blue this Z blue uh, Milgauss which I've been looking at for quite a while since last year um, I won't discuss that too much other than to say I'm still in my honeymoon period with this particular watch. Um, in terms of value, this one was £5,500, which is, I think, quite a lot for what it is. It's a simple three-hander. It's got the same case, albite, polished as Explorer 1, which is only, uh, what, £4,300. It does have that Faraday cage inside of it, which I guess would add some, some value there. It's got a fully polished case and... Uh, polished center link bracelet so fair enough that adds some value but just recently at the Baal show Rolex announced a new watch a new Rolex Air King which shares the same case and the same movement as the Rolex Explorer 1 as same as this one and not only that it also shares the same anti-magnetic um, Faraday cage that's inside this one to protect the movement and that watch is here. I've got a little picture of it in my Rolex book here. Hopefully you can see that. Now, some have said, oh God, that's a pretty ugly looking face. Um, I'm not so sure. I think it's a bit like the Milgauss in that you either love it or hate it. And that's great, I think, because it means it's actually got some um, emotion to it. Um, it has been said that now that the new Rolex uh, Explorer 1 has uh, loomed dials at 3, 6 and 9 they actually want to use their um, gold 18 karat white gold numerals on this particular dial but the point is that is £4,100 I think and it's essentially the same watch as the Milgauss it's got the same movement, the same case the same anti-magnetic uh, Faraday cage and so on it's just not polished so perhaps the Milgauss's days are numbered I have read online that it may be an attempt by Rolex to reduce their prices without actually really reducing prices in that rather than reducing the price of a, an existing model they just bring out a new model which is very similar but at a lower price um, quite clever really that doesn't really bother me because I still do like my middle gauss but in terms of value I think Rolex are very unusual in having a luxury product which doesn't depreciate like a stone the moment you buy it there are very very few products um, in this same sort of category that, that actually do retain their value so well whether it's a expensive car, expensive motorbike, jewellery, diamonds, whatever 
when you buy them from a shop and, and walk out the door, you're, you're usually you're going to lose up to half the value straight away. But Rolex, particularly Rolex sports models like these, they're very good at keeping their value, which although isn't the driving um, reason for me to buy them and to own them, it certainly is something to be considered. I wouldn't like to see this, for example, losing half its value within a year, which is what happened to my Zeniths, because that would have meant I've lost £4,000 just for the pleasure of owning this thing for a few months. Another question I've been asked uh, by folks who have noticed these watches and asked me how much they cost and so on, they're all somewhat shocked when they're told and the comment to get back is either you must be stupid or made of money or oh if I own that I'd never wear it outside I'd be afraid of losing it and scratching it and getting it stolen and I think that there is an element of that when you first buy one and you're wearing it for the first few days but to be honest after a week or so it, it just becomes another watch you wear it I, I really just don't think about it it's just my watch I like it uh, I don't flaunt it um, I've never had any comments about these expensive watches um, from anybody really. I think the only comment I've had is somebody said they liked the blue on that dial and they didn't even know it was a Rolex. Um, and why would they? Most, most people have no idea. So this idea that once you're wearing something like this, um, when you go outside you've got to be cautious and you've got to be very careful where you go, it's quite frankly bollocks. Um, unless you frequent some very dodgy areas at night. Um, I've never worried about it and never had a problem. Now all these three watches do share some common elements. They're all 40 millimeters in diameter. Um, they've all got the Oyster bracelet, a standard. Daytona obviously all brushed. The Milgauss and the Daytona have the famous PCLs, the polished center links, which again, folks, um, some folks don't seem to like, saying that they don't belong on a tool watch. Um, they're too easily scratched. They're too shiny and blingy. Um, I don't have a problem with it at all. I think they look great. Uh, if it gets scratched and when it goes back to service in, what, 10 years time, they'll polish it back up again and it'll be as good as new. Uh, it certainly doesn't stop me from wearing it outside or, or being active with these particular watches. Another element they all share is in their bracelet. They've all got an, the Easy Link or Glide Lock, in the Submariner's case, uh, adjustable bracelet in that you can um, adjust the size of the bracelet on the go very easily. Uh, the Milgauss and the uh, Daytona have the easy link um, adjustability where you get a 5mm half link extra um, length when required. It's very easy to change. Whereas the Submariner has the glide lock um, which gives you, oh god I don't know, 10mm plus um, completely adjustable on the fly which I really like and it's the one thing that I really love about Rolex the bracelets are so well made I mean I've handled an awful lot of high-end watches and own quite a few too and I can honestly say I've never had and never handled a bracelet as good as this it feels like it's a tank it's so well made it fits so well you've got that adjustability you've got the security of the clasp the double clasp here so that's like locks into place and then that pops out it's like a tank you know it ain't going to come off and um, why lots of other high-end manufacturers don't also provide an easy on-the-fly adjustment of um, a bracelet I have no idea in terms of timekeeping they're all absolutely fantastic uh, I have timed them all when I first got them but I haven't done it since and the best one was a Daytona which over 24 hours was at most a second out it was a second and fast which is pretty amazing the other two uh, were two seconds fast which again is bloody good I mean that's as good as I would ever need and I'm very happy with that indeed and another um, feature they all share is the oyster case the waterproof case with the screwing crowns this one the submariner is uh, waterproof to 300 meters whereas these two are 100 meters each and that's fine by me I get seasick in the bath, so I'm never going to need waterproofing down to 300 meters. But it's nice to have in terms of you not to worry about wearing them in the bath or, or having a shower or washing the dishes or just getting them wet out and about, um, which is a nice sort of feeling of security that you can have there. Well, I guess it's time I did a wrist watch check, I guess, and uh, showed you what they all look like on my wrist. So we'll start off with the Daytona. Um, there it is on my 
seven and a quarter inch wrist and it's a nice slim fit which I like it's sort of watch like the Milgauss which you kind of which you wear it doesn't wear you unlike some of the big heavy watches out there which you never can sort of really forget you're wearing it this is just a comfortable watch it doesn't shout you don't sort of feel the weight of it too much and it's a great fit and now the next one the Milgauss as you can expect it's pretty similar um, the dial is obviously bigger because it has a much slimmer bezel so it kind of wears a wee bit bigger but um, with a dial like that you know I'm not going to complain and finally the Submariner and it may surprise you to know that it wears really, really slim for a dive watch which is another reason why I like it and, and for me I know some people say oh it's a dive watch it's quite chunky but I actually find it wears quite small I think because the dial is quite small compared to the size of the case because you've got this bezel too um, it's, it certainly never feels bulky or, or too big it'll always fit under the sleeve so um, it makes a great everyday watch now I am trying to keep these videos down to a sensible size maybe about 10 minutes or so because any more than that and the videos get so big they use up so much they use up so much memory on my PC it takes hours to um, upload them and process them so what I'm going to do now is have a break this will be uh, a part one of a part two ramble and in part two I'll discuss uh, where I'm maybe going next uh, with my next watch or next two or three watches uh, is it worth going even higher to AP to JLC even to Patek Philippe and if I did do that how would that fit in with the rest of my collection and um, perhaps should I consolidate what I've got and get rid of a few parts change some uh, because at the moment I've got seven watches and that's for me one or two too many um, so that's something I'll discuss in part two uh, but first I need to uh, make a cup of tea and have a little break and cheers.